up, you beautiful bastards? Hope you've had a fantastic Tuesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, hit that like button, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today is this story out of Orlando, Florida. And I know you're like, ooh, Florida, what flavor of crazy are we getting today? And the story we're talking about today centers around Orlando police officer Dennis Turner. Now that name might sound familiar because the story actually starts back in September, specifically September 19th of last year. According to the police report of the incident, Turner was responding to a report that a six-year-old, quote, battered three staff members by kicking and punching them at her school. And apparently after Turner got there, he assessed the situation. He decided the best way forward was to arrest the six-year-old girl, who actually, according to reports, was only one of two six-year-olds that Dennis Turner arrested that week. Now, as far as what was happening with this little six-year-old girl, her grandmother told the press that this little girl, she suffers from a sleep disorder that the family's trying to resolve. It's resulted in some behavioral issues. Right, so in general, the reaction to this story was, what the hell, why would you arrest a six-year-old? Which, by the way, according to reports, the six-year-old was actually charged with battery, though the, the charges were never pursued. Now, what followed several days after this incident is that Dennis Turner was fired. But the reason that we're talking about this today is that the body cam footage has now been released and it is a heartbreaking watch. You see the moment that the police officer decides to and puts zip ties around the six-year-old's wrists. That's for you. Keep your hands, okay? Come over here, honey. It's not gonna hurt. You then see the police take the six-year-old off the property, take her to the vehicle. She's pleading the entire time. The officer then appears to walk back inside where it appears that the school staff is incredibly uncomfortable. The restraints are they necessary? Yes. Uh, and if she was bigger, she would have been wearing regular handcuffs. And then th there's this weird moment caught on the body cam footage where it seems like he's bragging about how many people he's arrested. And actually, previous to this, the youngest he had arrested was seven. 6,000 people I've arrested over the 28 years. A lot of people. I bet y'all. Um, seven is your youngest? Seven is the youngest. She's eight, isn't she? She's six. She's six. So now she has broken the record. She, she broke the record. This whole incident, as well as the way that he's talking about it here, it, it just feels off to me, but this also isn't a story about how this makes us feel. It's also a, a story about the law. What Turner did violated policy, but it's not technically illegal in the state of Florida. As the Tampa Bay Times explains, Orlando Police Department officials have said Turner violated agency policy on arresting children younger than 12, which requires officers to get a supervisor's approval, something Turner did not do. However, his decision was not illegal as Florida currently does not have a minimum age for arrest, which actually connects us to now the body cam footage being released, as well as the six-year-old's grandmother hoping that when people watch the footage of her granddaughter's arrest, they will support a proposal to change that law by making 12 the minimum age of arrest. And also adding she would like to see school resource officers receive more training and preparation, especially to work with young children. And so with this story, I wanted to ask, one, what do you think about this incident that was caught on body cam? But also two, do you think that there should be a minimum age of arrest? Right, because this is actually not just a Florida issue. The, this story got me interested. And so I, very odd Google search to have in my history now. I looked up minimum age of arrest and it turns out in the United States, only 21 states have a minimum arrest date. And of those 21, one, there's a range. It's as young as six years old in North Carolina and as old as 12 years old in California, with 14 states setting it at 10 years old. Right, but that also means that there are 29 states, including Florida, that have no minimum. So should there be one? I'd really love to know your thoughts on this one. And then, in a bit of internet -y news, there are very few people that I actually consider uh, the scum of YouTube. There are people I disagree with, some people that I think are assholes, but then you have people like Jay Station. And if you're unfamiliar with Jay Station, I am, I, I'm sorry that I'm bringing this to your attention, but he's a YouTube creator that's largely known for, for making videos where he contacts celebrities after they die. Also, you might remember last year he got blasted for clickbaiting Etika after Etika died. He also, more recently, faked his girlfriend's death. And in that video, he used it as a call to action to get another channel to a million subscribers because apparently that was a dream of hers. That situation then resulted in a he said, she said between Jay and the girlfriend, or I guess ex-girlfriend at this point, Alexia, which in her video, she does not paint a nice picture of Jay. Jay told me that he does not want me to have Instagram. He does not want me to have Facebook. He deleted all my contacts in my phone. I felt really controlled by him and I felt like he was trying to isolate me from my friends, 
from my family. One time he literally threw and whipped an iPhone at my face. And then the second time he grabbed me off the couch and threw me to the ground. He does not know how to control his anger and he lashes out on people for no reason. Like if I didn't do exactly what he said, he would just get so mad. Also, quick note, I pulled that kind of collection of videos from Drew Gooden, who if you want a much deeper dive into the situation, go watch his video, I'll link to it down below. Now, one of the bigger updates to the story that we ended up seeing is that Jay actually got arrested. According to the BBC, a, a warrant was issued. He was arrested and charged with assault and assault with a weapon, with Toronto police confirming that he would appear in court on March 16th. And now the most recent update is one, Jay says that he's taking an indefinite break, but could be back in a week or much longer. Ideally, it would be much longer. Also in the video, he apologizes, says he lost who he was in the pursuit of success. Personally, all those words feel empty to me, and th this largely because he also mentions that he doesn't have monetization on the channel anymore. And actually, on that note, YouTube has confirmed a tube filter that they did suspend his monetization, with YouTube also saying that the demonetization decision was precipitated by his arrest on February 3rd on charges of assault and assault with a weapon. But also, of note here, YouTube has said that, you know, that, that channel that he was building by faking his girlfriend's death, that has not been demonetized, and apparently YouTube says that his other channel, which has been suspended, could be up for reinstatement. So I guess the main point is, finally, Jay has been held accountable, kind of, but not really, and almost uh, definitely, probably not. We'll see. I, I imagine part of YouTube's decision here, it depends on what happens with the charges. And from that, I want to share some stuff I love today and today in Awesome, brought to you by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, a website, an online store, a whatever, make it with Squarespace. Squarespace empowers people to create their online web presence or launch their passion project. And everyone can find a home on Squarespace, from entrepreneurs and small business owners to photographers, new restaurants, bloggers, vloggers, musicians, actors, fashion designers, and so much more. The commonality, the unifier there is that they all trust and use Squarespace for their website needs. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever, and creating a beautiful website with Squarespace's all-in-one platform has never been so simple. It's extremely intuitive and easy to use. And with our award-winning marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the place to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Also, it doesn't hurt that you can get personalized support from their award-winning customer care team via email or live chat, whatever you need. They're available 24-7. And so if you want to make the smart move like so many have, already, go ahead and start your free trial today at squarespace.com slash phil. Definitely make sure you enter an offer code phil to get 10% off your first purchase. And the first bit of awesome today is an announcement slash tease that on tomorrow's podcast, which of course I upload to youtube.com slash a convo with, as well as all the good audio podcast possible sure, podcast platforms of your choice. Not sure what happened with my brain there. I'll release the brand new podcast with Rhett and Link. We talk about both business and personal. I was personally really, really interested in talking about kind of the reaction and fallout from them talking about how they were very religious, but really aren't now. They're really open and vulnerable and giving. It's, it's definitely one of my favorites. But yeah, look out for it. It goes up 12 Western, 3 Eastern tomorrow. Then we got the Honest trailer for Frozen 2. We had Patrick Stewart answering the web's most searched questions. We had director Ryan Johnson breaking down a scene from Knives Out, which by the way, if you haven't seen it yet, you should. Binging with Babish gave us that egg sandwich from Birds of Prey. We got the announcement trailer for Samurai Jack, Battle Through Time. We got the official trailer for A Quiet Place Part 2. If you're looking for more news, Rogue Rocket put out a piece on the school to prison pipeline debate. But if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then uh, let's talk about the really interesting medical news coming out of England. There's a new law there called Max and Kira's Law. It's set to actually start in May. And essentially it changes one part of the organ donation process. Instead of having to opt in to be an organ donor by default, you are set to be an organ donor, but you can opt out. Though, according to reports, relatives will still be asked for their opinion, which can lead to donations being blocked if they object regardless of the wishes of the deceased. And there are exclusions like people under the age of 18, if you've lived in England for less than a year. And as far as my opinion, and I'll admit I'm incredibly biased, I, I have PKD, I'm most likely going to need a kidney transplant at some point in my life. I'm a huge fan of this change in policy. I would love to see something like that in the United States. There are so many people every year needlessly dying, just waiting on a list, hoping for an organ that's never gonna come. And so you look to England and this law, and estimates right now, it's believed it'll lead to an additional 700 organ transplants each year by 2023, and cut down the list of 5,200 people waiting for life-changing surgery. And for those that are uncomfortable with it, they can opt out. But I think there, there's a large chunk of people who just don't really think about organ donation, right? It's not at the top of their list, but they wouldn't mind. Right, we're dead at that point. If we can be a life-saving resource, fantastic. In fact, Anthony Clarkson, he's the director of organ donation at NHS Blood and Transplant. He said, the majority of people tell us that they support organ donation in print Yet only around four in 10 have actually registered their decision. Which actually, on that note, the reason that it's called Max and Kira is to kind of honor this, this one moment. Dude, Kira Ball, she was a nine year old in a horrible car crash. And her father allowed doctors to use her organs to save four other lives, including another nine year old by 
the name of Max. Right, and it's amazing to see the impact just one person can have, right? One organ donor, I believe, can save up to eight lives, tissue donors, enhance the lives of so many. I've seen that number range from 50 to 100. But yeah, with this story, of course, I'd love to know your thoughts, especially because, like I mentioned before, I'm definitely very biased when it comes to this. Let me know, or don't, you dick. And then let's talk about updates around the situation with coronavirus. Right now, as of recording this video, worldwide, there have been over 80,000 cases with more than 2,700 deaths. Now, like we've talked about before, a bulk of those numbers are coming from China, but we are now seeing some more concerning numbers in other countries. And so let's go through some of them. Uh, the CDC has warned travelers to avoid all non-essential travel to South Korea. This because as of Tuesday morning, there are said to be 977 cases in that country. In Italy, we've actually seen the number of cases jump to 283 with the Italian government putting in place emergency measures. Also not a country, but the Diamond Princess Cruise, which is docked in Japan and had to quarantine its international group of passengers because of the coronavirus's spread. Really, there were 691 cases just from that ship. As of recording this video today, a fourth person from that cruise has died. In Iran, the number of cases is at 95 right now, though it's expected for that number to jump very soon. And in fact, Iran's deputy health minister has tested positive for the disease as well. And as far as the United States, there are currently 53 confirmed cases, though I, I will note something. As Axios points out, 36 are from the Diamond Princess, three were evacuated from Wuhan, 12 travel related, and two are person to person infections. Also, according to reports, the Trump administration sent a letter to Congress Monday requesting a funding commitment of at least 2.5 billion to help combat the spread of the novel coronavirus. This is reportedly to accelerate vaccine development, support preparedness, and response activities and to procure much needed equipment and supplies. And right now, while, while the President of the United States has offered a, a publicly optimistic outlook on the situation. You may ask about the uh, coronavirus, which is um, you know, very well under control in our country. We uh, have very few people with it. The people are getting better. They're all getting better. Uh, we brought in some Americans uh, from a ship because it was really the right thing to do and they're in quarantine. And uh, we think they'll be in very good shape very, very soon. And I think that whole situation will start working out. We're also now seeing reports that in the United States, we might need to brace. According to reports, a CDC official said, we are asking the American public to prepare for the expectation that this might be bad. That official, Nancy Messonnier, a top official for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, also saying, ultimately, we expect we will see community spread in the United States. It is not a question of if this will happen, but when this will happen and how many people in this country will have severe illnesses. With the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, also saying, this is an unprecedented, potentially severe health challenge globally. We cannot hermetically seal off the United States States to a virus and we need to be realistic about that. But also on the question of if this will become a pandemic, yesterday we saw the Director General of the World Health Organization say that, quote, for the moment, we are not witnessing the uncontained global spread of this virus and we are not witnessing large scale severe disease or death. Does this virus have pandemic potential? Absolutely it has. Are we there yet? From our assessment, not yet. And adding the key message that should give all countries hope courage and confidence is that this virus can be contained. Indeed, there are many countries that have done exactly that. With WHO Executive Director Mike Ryan also saying that it is time to do everything you would do in preparing for a pandemic, but also noting that they're trying to avoid that eventuality. But ultimately, that's where we are right now. We're gonna have to wait to see what, what happens from here, what happens with the spread, especially in countries outside of China. Yeah, definitely more concerning as the days come and go. And that is where I'm going to end today's show. And hey, if you liked the video, hit us with a like. If you're new here, subscribe. Also, if you're looking for more to watch, maybe you missed yesterday's film the Franco Show. If you did, I'd definitely love to know what you think of the first story. Or maybe you want to check out the newest podcast. You can click or tap right there to watch either of those right now. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow. I hope you like this video. Subscribe if you like it.